Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for attending the webinar tonight. Um, it's on sleep, myths and facts. And our presenter tonight is Dr. Simon Frankel, who has kindly joined us tonight. Acknowledgement of country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, MS Plus acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So this is a bit about um, Simon, Dr. Frankel, who is our presenter tonight. So um, Simon is a respiratory and sleep disorders physician from Lung and Sleep Victoria. Um, and with over 10 years experience consulting throughout Melbourne at Western Health and through private practice. Um, so expertise in all aspects of sleep medicine with a particular interest in non-respiratory sleep disorders. So insomnia, um, sleepiness, circadian rhythm disturbances and restless leg syndrome. Um, uses multidisciplinary models of care to optimise health outcomes for his patients. You know, actively involved in sleep education, Dr. Frankel has presented at numerous state and national scientific meetings, along with providing education to GPs and the general community. And he's also presently the co-chair of the Sleep Physicians Council of Australasia and the Sleep Association. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, to the team at uh, both MS Plus and uh, MS Australia for uh, putting this together. Um, uh, as already mentioned, I'm a, a sleep physician with a particular interest in um, all aspects of sleep medicine. Um, and uh, I guess presenting this talk uh, is important for me because it uh, it represents the intersection of a, a number, of, number of very important aspects of my life, uh, one of which is my professional practice as a sleep physician. Um, the other being that uh, MS being a, a you know prevalent condition within our community, um, uh, most of us you know will know someone or be closely associated with someone uh, with MS, and uh, you know on a personal level, uh, uh, that's certainly the case with me. So this is uh, yeah, an important intersection. Um, so what I'm hoping to do today is. Uh, I guess give a bit of an overview about what sleep is, what normal sleep is, um, how we can measure sleep, um, the type of things that can happen when sleep goes wrong, um, and then finally at the end touching on on um, sort of the tricky element of, of sleep and uh, and MS. So what is sleep was uh, the the question that first came to my mind when I uh, opened the phone book size textbook um, of sleep medicine and. Uh, the first sentence in the book was uh, by a Scottish physician, surgeon and philosopher by the name of uh, Robert McNish, um, who uh, said, uh, as you can see quoted there, that sleep is the uh, intermediate state of, oh, sorry, I lost my screen here, uh, uh, between wakefulness and death, with wakefulness being regarded as the active state of all of the animal and intellectual functions and death uh, as that of their total suspension. Uh, so helpful, but not particularly. And if you look very closely on the left-hand side of the slide, he was also the author of a possibly more interesting book, The, the Anatomy of Drunkenness. So what actually is sleep? Um, and it really it can be defined across multiple domains. So there is the personal experience of what we all experience as sleep as being a state you know, some degree of unawareness of your external environment. To an observer, we might be lying there quiet with our eyes closed and unresponsive. As a sleep physician, we would define sleep neurologically on the basis of characteristic uh, waveforms on an EEG recording that allow us to work out whether people are awake or asleep. And if they are asleep, the depth of sleep, whether it's REM or the various stages of non-REM sleep. But most importantly, it serves a, a, a functional purpose. We, we sleep for a reason. And again, that's something that's spread across multiple domains. There's increasing evidence that there is a very important housekeeping role of, of sleep that, um, you know, while our brain and muscles are asleep, there are various active phys physiological processes going on that basically allow things to return to um, a normal state um, of affairs for you know the baseline functioning for the beginning of the next day. Uh, it's also becoming increasingly evident that uh, the various elements of sleep are important for 
uh, memory processing um, and dreaming in fact uh, does appear to be, um, uh, although we don't exactly know why people dream, it does seem to serve a purpose with regards to uh, memory processing and consolidation. Uh, on the right hand side of the slide, you can see what's depicted there is the three pillars of health, um, those being uh, physical activity of some description, um, a healthy diet and, um, and sleep. So we need sleep working well um, for the other bits to function and for the roof not to cave in. So the perennial question that I get is how much sleep do I need? Um, and it's actually a bit of a tricky answer, but what I'm gonna do now is throw it out to uh, the listeners or the watchers um, for a poll to see what you reckon and we can take it from there. So hopefully um, you'll get the option to vote. It was 58% um, of people had said seven to eight. We had a few that said it depends um, and maybe one or two people had said, you know, six to seven hours or that eight to nine hours. Excellent, okay. Uh, so you never quite know where these things are gonna go, but that's probably what I would have predicted. And the good news is that you're all right um, uh, to an extent. Um, Generally, when I do multiple choice questions, if you get a vague one, like it depends, I'll usually go for that. But um, yeah, the, the most the most common response would be the seven to eight hours. And um, one of the reasons as to why that is, is actually um, a historical reason from uh, that had its origin in Melbourne. So anyone listening from Melbourne, um, the monument here is known as the Eight Hour Day uh, Memorial and it's on the corner of uh, Russell Street and Victoria Street um, across the road from what used to be the Trades Hall Council. And so this monument was erected, I think, in the early 1900s, but it um, recognises um, a workers' movement from the mid-1800s where a bunch of, I think they were stonemasons, um, downed tools and marched on state parliament demanding fair rights for workers and an eight-hour day of work. And after several weeks of protest, they were granted their wishes and the law was enacted and Victoria was actually the first place in the world to legislate an eight hour working day. And so what you can see on the top of that monument is the, uh, the numbers 888, which represent eight hours work, eight hours recreation and eight hours rest. And so at least some of the myth of needing eight hours sleep comes from, um, uh, comes from this movement in Victoria um, from the 1800s. Uh, a number of years ago, probably about 10 years ago now, um, there was an international um, uh, body that was established to review available scientific literature and to come up with some sort of a, a magic number about the number of hours of sleep that is required. And the document they produced having analysed about 5,000 scientific papers um, had a headline statement that the average adult needs an, a, a minimum of seven hours of sleep on a regular basis for um, optimal functioning, which was fantastic on face value. But um, as with all of these things, the devil was in the detail and there was quite a bit of fine print and um, a number of caveats. And what this slide shows is that sleep requirements across the lifespan um, change. They, they generally get um, less as we get older. And although for the average healthy adult, um, uh, seven hours is a rough estimate. Um, you know, seven to nine hours is generally considered to be okay with, you know, a bit less than that and a bit more than that possibly being okay when you read the literature. Um, and, and, and none of this really applies or it's unknown how it applies to people with chronic illnesses. So although it's helpful to talk in generalities about how much sleep someone needs, um, at an individual level, that is sometimes hard to determine. And so we get into these, uh, you know, sort of circular discussions about the amount of sleep that someone needs is really the amount that allows them to undertake their daily functions without undue limitation. But using that sort of seven to nine hour um, uh, estimate is, is not a bad way uh, to start. Uh, and in fact, uh, sleep requirements vary quite considerably across the population. So there are, you know, very famous long sleepers. So we've got uh, LeBron James, probably one of the best uh, basketball players uh, ever to have played, um, will consistently sleep 15 hours a night. Um, 
Uh, Mariah Carey, probably more my wife's cup of tea than mine. Um, also 15 hours a night. Uh, uh, Thomas Edison um, uh, was uh, famously has said that there, there's no real reason why men should go to bed at all. Um, so he was reportedly a short sleeper, but in fact had a, a bed in his laboratory and would catnap frequently during the day. So he probably slept a bit more than he recognised. Um, and then there are an example down the bottom there of um, uh, you know, the reasons why insufficient sleep can cause significant um, you know, mental instability and um, poor decision making. All right, so how do we measure sleep? Um, uh, there's a number of different ways of doing it in, and in my patients, depending on what um, uh, the particular complaint is, we might use one or sometimes a combination of these um, modalities of measurement. So on the uh, left hand side, um, uh, there's a, a sleep diary which uh, allows people to con contemporaneously record after they've woken in the morning um, the number of hours that they've slept during the night and any time that they've been awake. Um, and so it gives us uh, an indication of what someone's subjective of, um, experience of sleep is um, and is often a good way of um, initially assessing uh, insomnia, for example. Uh, in the middle panel uh, are the various um, sleep trackers that are on the market now and there are uh, multiple varieties of these uh, that at a population level, uh, at a, a reasonable at, at measuring probably sleep duration more accurately than sleep depth. Um, and so what they're able to do is give us a very low fidelity recording um, of, of some element of sleep, um, but over an extended period of time, um, uh, albeit a little probably inaccurately with regards to depth of sleep. Um, uh, when compared with the panel on the right, which is um, the you know 100 wires that get hooked up when we bring someone into a sleep laboratory and uh, and measure their sleep more accurately in that regard, and so there's various ways that we can you know that we can sequence these um, uh, types of measurements uh, depending on the individual. So what are the types of things that that people can experience when when sleep goes wrong? Um, Again, it's multifaceted. So the, the most common things in the wider community are, are things like snoring and sleep apnea. So you know, partners reporting you know, disruptive snoring, possibly people stopping breathing when they're asleep. Um, insomnia will often be manifest as either a difficulty getting to sleep or if someone wakes during the night, difficulties getting back to sleep or perhaps waking earlier in the morning than desired. Uh, there can be various forms of uh, sleep disturbance through the night and often when sleep is disturbed there are uh, impacts with regards to daytime function um, with sleepiness, tiredness and fatigue being uh, different manifestations of that. Uh, we see a number of people with restless legs syndrome, uh, uncomfortable sensations in the legs, usually worse in the evening that um, necessitate people moving the legs around to, to settle down those sensations and sometimes needing medication to control it. Uh, various types of sleepwalking, sleep talking, sleep eating, acting out dreams, so things that go bump during the night. Um, and problems with the internal clock, so with sleep timing, so uh, people falling asleep, you know, later than desired and, and waking later than desired or falling asleep too early or a bit of a mixture of the two. So there's a number of different ways that um, sleep disorders can, um, can manifest. So who can help when, when they do? Um, there are a number of, uh, of healthcare professionals um, uh, whose domain includes um, management of sleep disorders. So you know, the medical practitioner side of things, um, GPs uh, are often the first port of call. Um, sleep specialists like myself, if they're uh, more tricky uh, sleep issues. Uh, there are some neurologists who have an interest in sleep, um, probably an increasing number, um, uh, but m many neurologists, if they think there is a primary sleep disorder, will, will refer along to a sleep specialist. And there are certainly a number of um, um, people who I co-manage with neurologists who have underlying neurological uh, issues, you know, MS or Parkinson's disease, where they'll be 
certificates lead components who you know will will co-manage uh, patients in that regard. Uh, but there are other allied health professionals, both uh, general psychologists, so clinical psychologists, but also um, uh, clinical psychologists who have done additional training in sleep medicine, who can deliver sleep specific um, forms of therapy, such as a, a particular version of uh, a cognitive behavioural therapy that has been designed for insomnia, for example, and that's uh, best delivered by, by a sleep psychologist. Um, and other members of multidisciplinary teams. So there are an um, increasing number of, of nurses, for example, particularly in rural and regional areas who, who can deliver this type of intervention um, and sleep coaches as well. There's an increasing online presence um, for uh, sleep information and sleep therapy. Um, and I've, I've got a slide at the end that lists some of them, but um, uh, just making sure that you get that from reliable sources. So the Sleep Health Foundation is um, um, a non-profit um, uh, uh, Australian-based advocacy group for, um, for sleep issues. And they've got some good fact sheets about various sleep disorders. Uh, and there are um, some online um, modules available for people who are interested in treatment for insomnia. Um, there's one in particular called This Way Up, which uh, is, uh, is based out of Sydney, um, uh, Uni of New South Wales and St Vincent's Hospital there that um, have got a very good um, insomnia program, um, some of which is actually uh, open access and free and other aspects that you need to pay for. Um, there is another one uh, called Sleepio that used to be available in Australia, but for some reason at the moment isn't, but um, that was also a good um, online module to deliver those types of interventions. Um, so, oh, John, see that factors which can affect sleep or that can affect sleep. So I'm not sure we should have a poll on, I think the grammar might be wrong there, but apologies for that. Maybe factors that can affect sleep. Anyway, the various things that can affect sleep. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's pretty complicated. And a number of the arrows that I've got there go both ways that th these particular issues can affect sleep. But if sleep isn't good, it can have um, uh, you know the countermeasure effect on 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 that issue. So you know the things that we ingest, caffeine, alcohol, recreational drugs, can all um, often negatively uh, affect sleep. Uh, you know particularly alcohol, which although it gives the perception of deeper sleep, it often results in significantly poorer quality sleep and um, more frequent wakenings during the night. Various prescriptions medication can impact on sleep and wake regulation, um, both by making people more sleepy or in some people causing insomnia. Uh, anxieties and stress um, uh, can obviously impact sleep, but when sleep isn't working that well, it can uh, you know, amplify those problems as well. Uh, and more broadly in the mental health realm, um, you know, and mood disorders as well, um, are very tightly uh, you know, related uh, with sleep in a bi-directional way. Uh, shift work, um, about 20% of our workforce um, uh, are shift workers and many of them have issues with sleep regulation. Um, obviously there are a number of sleep disorders that um, by virtue of the fact that they're sleep disorders, um, you know, will impact on sleep. And then, yeah, the elephant in the room, which is, um, which is MS. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that briefly at the end. I've, I've deliberately there put a sort of a, a unidirectional um, arrow in that um, MS can certainly affect sleep, but I think as to whether sleep can impact MS outcomes, I think that that is less um, convincingly defined at the moment. So we know that sleep issues are considerably more common um, in people with MS than in the general population. And there are some surveys that have um, indicated that, that about two thirds of people with MS um, uh, to, at some stage or to some extent will experience issues with poor quality sleep and there will be knock on effects with regards to um, reduced quality of life as a result of that. Um, so MS can impact on sleep you know, in, in a number of different ways. So, you know, if there are particular uh, MS symptoms, be it pain or continence symptoms or issues with temperature regulation, they can all most certainly impact on sleep. 
any related mood or anxiety issues could do the same. Uh, depending on how the MS uh, affects an individual and where individual plaques are sitting, um, the, the machinery for, for driving and regulating sleep and wakefulness is, um, is housed um, uh, in, in the part of the brain known as the brainstem or the, or the upper part of the brainstem and um, any, any lesions in those areas of the brain have got the potential to affect sleep um, either by causing insomnia or excessive sleepiness or, or, or other impacts. And obviously medication can, uh, can have an effect as well. Um, sleep can impact on MS um, with regards to fatigue. So if sleep, if there are problems with sleep, then that can um, either cause problems with fatigue or perhaps compound pre-existing problems with fatigue, which is obviously a big issue in MS. Um, we know that pain perception when sleep is, um, is problematic um, uh, can also be altered. Um, but as I alluded to earlier, the, the impact of poor sleep on MS outcomes is, is hard to, to really nut out. And I don't know that we've really got definitive um, answers about that at the moment. Um, and I guess the, the, the final thing to remember in this regard is that um, not everything necessarily relates to MS. So it sometimes might just be that you've got someone with MS, but they just have snoring and sleep apnea because they've got big tonsils and a blocked nose. So not everything needs to be tied back into the MS all the time. Um, and just I guess to wind up, I was um, asked to just touch briefly on sleep and menopause. And you know, this is, um, a well-recognised and emerging area of, um, of sleep disturbance, um, primarily because it's thought that about 50% of women will experience some issue with their sleep in perimenopause. And as with all this stuff, it's very multifactorial. So it might be issues with temperature regulation and hot flashes and other vasomotor type symptoms. Um, that are primarily related to um, a reduction in estrogen levels. And estrogen um, uh, is important among other things in terms of keeping um, the body temperature low. Uh, there can be anxiety related to you know, becoming menopausal and having menopausal type symptoms that can impact on sleep. And again, you know, the insomnia might not be due to any of this at all. Uh, sleep apnea uh, uh, can be more common in perimenopausal women, um, thought at least partly due to the impacts of um, a reduction in progesterone levels, um, which um, results in more relaxation and more collapsibility of the upper airway, which can predispose people to snoring and sleep apnea. Uh, restless legs um, is also thought to be more common, um, possibly due to um, changes in, in iron metabolism. Um, and there may also just be issues that are completely unrelated to gender. So as I alluded to earlier, we, we do require a little less sleep as we get older. Um, and what happens to many people, um, uh, particularly in advanced age, is uh, sleep times shift earlier. Um, so people will you know, fall asleep much earlier in the evening, but wake up much earlier in the morning. Uh, hormone replacement therapy does have some role in this, in both sleep apnea and insomnia. Um, but you know, it's a complicated discussion with um, you know with primary care physicians or specialists about the you know, the risk benefit um, balance of, uh, of of going down that pathway. Uh, so just to wind up, there, there these are a few of the resources that I thought um, you know if you're interested in having a, a bit of a dive into some sleep stuff. Um, um, as I learned from my kids, um, the, the good websites are the .orgs and the .govs and the .edus um, because they're coming from approved organisations rather than the .coms, which could be coming from any, from anywhere. So um, I've got the Sleep Health Foundation, which is the, the Australian advoc advocacy group and some very good fact sheets there about various sleep disorders. Uh, there's the US equivalent, which is the National Sleep Foundation. Um, some information there about uh, cognitive behavioural therapy as a, a non-medication based uh, treatment for insomnia. Uh, and just another plug for that, um, the This Way Up uh, website. So they do uh, both insomnia, but there's also a mental health, um, depression, anxiety component to it as well. Um, it's a very, very good website. 
Um, so I guess in conclusion, um, sleep is, uh, you know, one of the important pillars of, of our health. Um, um, and we need to make sure that we're doing whatever we can to optimise uh, people's sleep quality and quantity. Um, but there's no magic number of hours um, that, that, that an individual needs, um, or not that's easy to define anyway. Uh, sleep issues are more common in, in people with MS, um, uh, but they're not always caused by the MS. Um, so I would urge you know people with any um, specific complaints about sleep to to you know address those with you know whichever healthcare practitioner they they feel most engaged with, and there there will be a pathway to get that sorted out. Um, and I think that that's all I had to say. So I've got a, a complicated Salvador Dali print there just to confuse things. But um, I'm happy to answer some questions if there are any. I had a question. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Sam. I didn't know about the 888. So I'm very, um, I was very pleased to know about that little information. Thank you for that. Always good to learn something like that. There's a lot of now, there's a rise of people who've got sleep coaches and sleep psychologists and, um, Particularly in the sleep coach space, there's a lot of um, people who you can sign up with who help you sleeping. Is that because, do you think that's because sleeping has become a bigger problem? Like that, that generally in society, do you think it's a bit of bigger problem or is it just becoming a little bit more of a, um, or is it just a little bit more of an opportunity or, you know, there's so much more about sleeping now. Yeah, I, I think it's probably a bit of both. I think that there's certainly um, been more of an appreciation, and I think the Sleep Health, the Sleep Health Foundation um, has got to be thanked for that, for bringing sleep into the you know public domain in terms of something to talk about. Um, so I think it's partly due to you know, greater recognition by general public, by healthcare practitioners about the importance of sleep. Um, and I think that some people, um, you know, have understandably seen that as a um, an, un an unmet need. Um, and so, you know, for sleep psychologists, for example, um, uh, you know, there, there there aren't many of them around, um, and and so access to these types of people is is difficult. And I did actually speak just the other week to a sleep coach because I was sort of I was a little bit sceptical about. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, snake, snake oil merchants, um, mm -hmm. and and she was actually very well credentialed. She'd done um, uh, a number of um, uh, face to face and online credentialed courses to actually learn the art of sort of delivering that um, um, that type of intervention. And so I think if people, I, I don't think there's any particular problem with going down that pathway, but. Um, I guess buyer beware and just you know, do your research, see see what someone's background is and where they where they've come from. Um, but there are certainly some good practitioners out there who, uh, you know, perhaps don't have university degrees necessarily, but have done um, you know a lot of education around it and who could be trusted. Yeah, we often think we can do, fix things on our own or on Instagram. <laughs> so, and it's um and these coaches, I, I I am learning more that's having someone. I mean, someone to guide you through that can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, Simon, there was a question that came through about whether we can catch up on sleep, if that is something that people can actually do. Mm, yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, so sleep loss is, uh, it's a very big um, issue throughout the population. So the, everyone's got busy lives. Um, and the first thing that gets chipped away is sleep. And so um, most people are thought to have some degree of chronic sleep deprivation. Um, we know that in the acute models of sleep deprivation, that if you deprive someone of sleep for a short period of time, that they will have recovery sleeps and they will catch that sleep up. Um, what's less well defined is in people who perhaps miss out on a little bit of sleep over a long period of time, whether that can be recovered and what the impacts of that that's much less well defined, but we do know that um, there appear to be adverse um, uh, health, metabolic, um, cardiac, neurological outcomes in people who chronically don't sleep enough. Um, so it's a matter of being able to try and prioritise sleep. Um, but in terms of the models of chronic sleep loss, um, it's not 
clear how much, if it's a one-for-one -one transaction where if you miss out on an hour of sleep, you know, is an hour of recovery sleep going to pay that back enough? In the short term, yes. In the long term, much less well defined. Great, thank you. And we also actually had a question come through um, regarding dealing with sort of sensory symptoms waking people while they're sleeping so pins and needles or even you know feet feeling really numb and cold and tingling I guess do you have sort of tips around how people can manage that and the impact on their sleep? Yeah that that's complicated because that um, you know this is where the whole issue with MS being so diverse in terms of how it can impact people individually and um, you know, me seeing someone with MS who is describing these symptoms, my my initial approach is, well, you know, are we dealing with someone who has got, you know, for example, you know, sensory neurological problems related to their MS per se, or have we got someone with, you know, primary restless leg syndrome? Um, where you know whether or not they had MS, they've got restless legs, and we need to be treating that in, in its own right. Um, and so, as a clinician, me trying to tease that apart um, um, is important and not always straightforward. Um, so, from my perspective, it's a matter of you know being able to examine someone and um, seeing whether there's anything abnormal on examination. If there's a neurologist involved, sometimes speaking to them about. Um, what the neurological manifestations of that person's MS are. Um, but if I do think that it's restless leg syndrome, um, iron is extremely important. And so making sure that someone has got um, uh, very good iron storage levels is critical. Uh, some people with mild restless legs will find that um, physical activity, particularly in the evenings, can help calm them down. Um, or if they if they're getting these symptoms, you know, during the night, you know, having a bit of a walk around. But if the symptoms are, are problematic and not responding to those um, more conservative, you know, measures, then a medication-based approach um, is is where we head. Great, thank you. Um, and another question we've actually had several questions about this is not so much the lack of sleep, but oversleeping. You know, is there a an impact from having too much sleep, you know, someone saying they're sleeping eight to nine hours every night and they still feel like napping during the day, you know, is there a possibility that they're getting too much sleep? Yeah, so it's not, it's not, um, in, in a healthy person, it's not possible to get too much sleep. So uh, your your body will, will generally only allow the sleep that's required and you'll wake, you know, naturally and spontaneously after that time. If someone is allowing sufficient um space and time and opportunity for sleep and despite sleeping that time they are unable to you know maintain wakefulness in situations during the day where they're otherwise wanting to be awake uh, or in people who are needing to in addition to their nighttime sleep have you know, planned scheduled naps during the day then those types of manifestations are often an indication that there's something going on um, so if you're not able to stay awake in scenarios where you want to, or if you're needing to have additional and extended sleeps during the day, um, then that could be an indication that that there that someone has got excessive sleepiness, and that that itself would merit evaluation. Um, so yeah, I guess the simple answer is it's not possible to oversleep, but if someone is needing a lot of sleep um, or unable to function properly during the day because of sleepiness, then that should be investigated. Great, thank you. Actually, I've just remembered, somehow I, 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 there was a slide that I've just, I've just realised I skipped past. So if I've got time at the end, I, I had a slide about healthy sleep tips as well. But if you've got more questions, sure. I'm happy to deal with those first. Yeah, sure. Um, one of the other questions that we had got was regarding, I guess, getting off long-term use of, um, you know, sleep medication um, to assist in establishing a new sleep pattern. So how someone might go about that. Yeah, so it's it's a common problem because we we know that you know um, in, in terms of the way that insomnia has been um, conceptualised and studied and treated over the years, we know that about seventy percent of people with insomnia will 
um, have either a significant improvement in their insomnia or remission of their insomnia with cognitive behavioural therapy. So with a non-medication based approach, um, as I mentioned earlier, delivered either online or face-to-face -face with sleep type psychologist um, so that we can avoid medication. But medication um, is used in a lot of people because it's just easier. Um, and for some people, it's the only choice that we've got. And you know, about 30% of people who do cognitive behavioral therapy will have residual insomnia and will need medication. So there is a role for medication, but there are a group of people who get stuck on medication that is either um, ineffective or um, um, you know, unhelpful or causing side effects. And so um, in people on sleep type medication, sleeping tablets, you know, temazepam or Stillnox or, you know, whatever the flavour of the month is. There are ways of stopping it, um, but in people who have been on it for a long time, it's best done as part of a, a planned and structured approach because what often happens if they say, oh, I'm not going to take it tonight, um, is that they will get rebound insomnia. And so by engaging with uh, some sort of a clinician, sleep coach, sleep psychologist, sleep physician, um, uh, and having uh, strategies in place about, okay, this is what we anticipate when we maybe not try and stop it, maybe it's just trying to reduce the dose initially or look at alternate day dosing. There's various ways of sort of tapering it off, but having non-medication based strategies to deal with the insomnia that is likely to occur when 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 you do sort of try and stop it. So it's almost like sort of quitting smoking in a way that you wouldn't tell someone to go and just go cold turkey. You want to have it a you know a planned approach that'll optimize the chance of that um, intervention working and for insomnia it'd be having strategies, non-medication strategies in place to um, to help with the tapering and hopefully you know cessation of the sleeping tablet medication. Great, thank you. And I guess the last sort of question that we've um, also had a few um, comments around is, I guess, um, stimulants like coffee, you know, is there a latest time in the day you should be having this? Can that have an impact on things like frequent waking at night? What's your view on that? Coffee is great. And um, uh, it's a completely uh, legitimate stimulant. Um, so, um, it is okay to drink, you know, whether it's coffee or tea. I mean, remember there's there's caffeine in, in, in tea as well, a bit less than coffee, but there's still caffeine in tea um, or in you know, various sort of soft drinks and other things like that. Um, generally, so the recommendation is less than five cups of coffee a day, which is a lot. Um, once you're beyond that, you can start getting, you know, toxicity from, from the caffeine, you know, palpitations, anxiety, nausea. Um, so generally first half of the day, so in, in patients who I see uh, who are experiencing problems with insomnia, I'll say, look, you know, after lunch or early afternoon, cut the caffeine. Um, it, it's really the only thing that, that's causing people's sleep problems, but you're just wanting everything that you can have on your side to um, optimise the chances of good quality sleep at night. So yeah, I actually sort of set a cut off as early afternoon. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Simon. Um, I will make you the presenter again so you can share oh, yeah, that sorry, um, slide that you were talking about. No, that's all right. It just gets back to sort of just, yeah, sort of what you're asking about, just some basic sleep tips. Uh, okay, here we go. Yeah, so this is basically sort of what we call sleep hygiene, essentially. So it's basically just, you know, good habits around sleep and, um, you know, those habits are having a, a regular routine. So you've got you know, the, the, the master clock um, sits a, in a part of your brain called uh, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Um, but that clock talks to the individual clocks that literally exist in every one of the trillion cells in your body. And so by having a reg regular sleep wake rhythm, um, it gets all those clocks uh, essentially beating in unity. And by having a regular sleep time that is ideally started by having a reasonably regular wake time in the morning, um, it, it, it gets all of those um, you know, biological systems nicely in sync. 
uh, ideally wanting to minimise daytime naps. So um, if you do need to nap during the day, it's best to do that as a power nap. So, you know, 15, no more than 20 minutes um, and setting an alarm because what, what happens if you sleep longer than that is that you wake up with that, a lot of that inertia that you have when you get up first thing in the morning um, because you've been into the deeper stages of sleep. Um, and it also, in people with insomnia, um, it's taking away from some of that high sleep drive that we want people to be experiencing when they're going to sleep at night. So you don't want if avoidable uh, extended uh, daytime naps. And those, those power naps can have an alerting effect of anything up to you know, sort of four to six hours after a power nap. Um, maintaining activity during the day is important. We'll also um, you know, minimise the, the risk of having unexpected naps. Um, talked about caffeine already. Uh, minimising alcohol and large meals before bed. Um, you want a bedroom environment that is conducive to sleep. Um, so comfortable, quiet. In my shift workers, some of them even use you know, sort of blackout material to, to keep it dark during the day. Uh, you want nice ambient temperatures. Um, generally, they recommend somewhere between 13 and 23 degrees. Anything beyond those extremes, people will struggle to sleep. Um, and yeah, usually something in the middle is about right. Uh, and restricting, basically, uh, all you're doing in bed is sleeping, um, is good sleep hygiene. And the light exposure is, ex is important because light is the primary controller of our biological rhythms and timing. Um, and uh, light in the morning sets the clock for the day and uh, light in the evening will keep people awake and um, on, on the top picture there um, you know the perennial um, handheld devices are all very um, bright with blue enriched light which is actually um, uh, the, the, the stronger wavelength in terms of controlling rhythm so we try and minimize the usage of that in the evenings and particularly in bed um, in people where we're really wanting to restrict light exposure, um, I've got a picture of Bono there to remind me that um, yellow or orange glasses will prevent that blue light from getting in. So often people using uh, those types of glasses of an evening or nighttime to minimise um, evening light exposure. Uh, there are devices in, in people uh, where we're wanting to give them light at particular times that we can um, uh, provide them with light therapy devices that will deliver the right wavelength light. Uh, but just keeping in mind that the bottom photo there is that the that the cheapest intervention um, is actually the natural light um, and yeah, to allow our clocks to be uh, controlled by the, the cycle of the sun. So yeah, I think that was the only slide I missed. Hopefully I didn't miss too much more. Excellent. Thank you for that, Simon. That was really, really great. No problems. Thank you. Thank you again, Simon. Thank you for that. That was a fantastic overview of sleep and reminds us all of the importance of sleep and particularly in people with MS. I think um, that sleep is, uh, it, it can, can be really challenging, but so important because, you know, it's, it's a battle, uphill battle against fatigue a lot as well too. So getting that right sleep and um, and I think hearing from a sleep physician is just, just really cements the importance of it. Um, and hopefully encourages people to have a conversation with their neurologist as well too, to say, I'm not sleeping. It might not just be MS. It might be something else. It might be sleep apnea. Um, you know, and, and often then, you know, the neurologist is going to forget to ask if you snore, but it's really important to tell people that, that, so, that um, so that they can involve this whole team that we're developing around helping people sleep. So, um, so I think that's great to be able to prompt the conversation as well too. Yeah, exactly right. Great. Thank you both. Um, so um, that sort of concludes the webinar for tonight. So um, this is just a slide showing, you know, the other services and supports that you can get through MS Plus. Um, and we have resources. So including this webinar will be uploaded on our website on the resource hub. Um, we've got some great sleep resources there and this will be one of them. Um, and you can always get in touch with us at Plus Connect with the details there. And if you want to stay online and just answer a short survey and just give some feedback about the session, that would be great. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks and have a great night. Thank you. Bye.